But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. These are the inspired words that were shared by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter, found in what we call 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. I'd like for you to turn with me there now in your copy of the Scripture. If you're using the Pew Bible, that's on page 1016. Tonight I want to go through a lesson that's going to focus exclusively on this one verse. And there's a couple of reasons why I chose to do this. The first reason is because Inside this one single verse is everything that a Christian needs in order to understand how they need to live their life as a servant for Christ. In this one verse. So we're going to look at that formula, that pattern that's set forth in just these few words found in 1 Peter 3.15. But I do have a second reason for doing it, which is this. In about one month's time, in the month of July, we're going, as a congregation, we're going to embark upon something that we have not done before. We are going to engage in a congregational effort to strengthen our evangelism efforts here in Katy. And I'm not going to go into the details of that now because John and Jordan have worked long and hard uh, to prepare what the structure of that program is going to look like. And I'm excited about what the second half of this year is going to hold but what I thought we might do is look at this lesson tonight as almost a way to prepare for what we're going to have an opportunity to do in the second half of this year. Meaning if we take to heart the things that we find in this one verse, then we can prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for something that could prove to be very powerful and very special for the body of Christ here in Katy as we go into the second part of the year. So if you have it, please turn there in your copy of the scriptures. And I want you to consider that we need to set the stage in any verse that starts off with the word but. Okay, because that means there's a connection point between what we're reading and something that's happened previous. And so in order to set the stage, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that he's referencing in this one word, but? And the thing that I would call your attention to is what you find in verse 14 just prior. You'll notice in verse 14 that it says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And of course, if you pay close attention to what's encapsulated there in verse 14, that's actually a reference back to Isaiah 8 verse 12. And what Isaiah is talking about back in the verse that's referenced in verse 12, he's warning God's people that while you are being threatened in various ways, do not let the fear of what man can do to you supersede the fear or the reverence that we should have for the justice that God represents. And it's an interesting thing to understand that when you're considering this one word here, but, that Peter's referencing, because the stage that has been set here for our brothers and sisters back in the first century at the time in which this letter was written is something that we should all pay very close attention to. It is generally accepted that that letter was written between 60 and 70 AD. And if you don't know much about that period of time in history, Christians were under an enormous amount of persecution. To live as a Christian meant that you were subject to potential capital punishment, meaning if it was known that you were a practicing Christian, then your life would be laid on the line for that admission. And history shows us that in a variety of forms, that this is a very real thing that Christians had to deal with. And also, it was a very dangerous lifestyle because you never could feel completely comfortable with your current disposition because if you were to be a Christian, you were to be a follower of Christ. If you were to be a follower of Christ and you lived by faith and people around you knew this and it wasn't something that was hidden, but in doing so, it could cost you your physical life. And we know this is true because all you have to do is look at chapters like Acts chapter 7 or the fact that Paul was running nearly every town that he ever went to to try and evangelize and teach people about Jesus. And on and on it goes. We don't have to dig deep to know that this is very true. 
Now, to make the point abundantly clear, though, it just so happens that during the time in which Peter was writing this letter, this was during the reign of the emperor Nero. Now, I'm not going to go into a deep history lesson here, but what I can tell you is that Nero reigned as the emperor of Rome for 13 short years. He entered into that position at the age of 16 and was notorious for how evil and debaucherous this individual was. Murder was something he did for fun. In fact, if you've ever researched where the term Roman candle comes from, you know, that's not a firework, even though that's what you and I typically think of it as. Where that term was coined was back during the reign of Nero when for amusement, for enjoyment, for fun, he would take Christians and during a dinner party or to light a certain street, he would bind them up and light them on fire as a sign to everyone that was a Christian to know this is what fate awaits you if it becomes known that you are a practicing Christian. One artist depicted this image to, to give a, a visualization to what this looked like, and I'll call your attention to the fact that the onlookers here were just enjoying the fact that there were some Christians being prepared to be burned to death as they had their night of entertainment and their night of fun. And this was called a Roman candle. So when you have data like this to compare to the scriptures that we read, when he talks about their faith being tested by fire, if you deal with these trials before a time, it takes on an entirely different meaning than something that you and I can fully appreciate when something like this is the farthest thing from our minds when we think about what we might suffer in a physical sense for our faith. And it's, it's a powerful thing to wrap your mind around because at the same time, these same Christians are talked about in Scripture, in Acts 17, verse 6, it says, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. You know, one might think if you knew that you were going to die if the government of that day found out that you were a Christian, that you might keep that kind of quiet, that you might do that in secret, that you might hide in the shadows as you go about trying to teach people about Christ. And I'm sure some did. They're human. But they had a reputation that we can read about in Scripture that says that they were turning the world upside down. Not the people burning others for the sake of Christianity, but for the fact that they were teaching people about Jesus and people were being converted as a result of that. They were considered to be turning the world upside down. And you know, it makes me stop and think just as a side that here in the United States of America, we live in a country that allows us to practice our faith openly with freedom, freedom of religion. And yet we've been sold a lie that all too many people believe, which is there's two things you don't talk about, and that's politics and religion. And what happens when you start to believe that lie is that you end up with a government that functions like ours does and a declining number of people that are in the Lord's church and, and beyond, just spiritual in general, they become very apathetic to it because we don't talk about politics and religion. But I, I'm almost curious, if you go back to Acts 17, verse 6, and you ask those people, do you talk about politics and religion? I'm pretty sure I know what the answer to that would be. And so as we bring it to an application for today, we ought to think about the example that's been set that it's been much worse, brothers and sisters and friends, in terms of what our church families had to deal with when it comes to sharing the gospel. Much, much worse. But that's not the only point that is being made here as Peter writes this verse. In light of all that, that was just to set the stage. In light of all that, he gives a formula, a prescription on how a Christian ought to carry themselves despite their circumstances. And he starts by saying, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And this is something that is an internal thing that goes on inside the heart and mind of a Christian. In your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And when you look at that, 
It makes sense because a Christian has died to themselves. Is that not what happens when a person gives their life to Christ in the waters of baptism? Are we not told that you die to yourself only to live in Christ? That's exactly what takes place in that moment. And so it stands for reason that then there's something that has preeminence in our heart, preeminence in our mind, and that needs to be Christ. And he needs to be considered holy. And he needs to hold that place in your hearts. Or not. You see, that's the thing is we've all been given this incredible power that is called free will. We get to choose. In the same way that your free will, if you are a Christian, led you to give your life to Christ, to die to yourself, to live in Him, well, that same free will can be exercised in such a way that you choose to not honor Christ and to fall back on that commitment. And it's a very real struggle. It's a very real thing that every one of us in this room has to face multiple times over again before we pass from this earth. And the way I like to, you know, kind of envision this and and i learned this from patrick tompkins who i'm sure learned it from someone else and if you guys know patrick who've been here a long time actually ran into him a few weeks ago which was unexpected and a blessing he said when the bible talks about the heart it's talking about the not the thump thump but the think think okay so when the bible's talking about your heart when it's saying honor in your hearts to honor christ as holy it's talking about in your mind honor christ as holy Okay, so we put in our minds that Christ is holy, that we live in him, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But there are some things that can stand in the way of this. There's some things that can prevent us from doing this well. Things like worrying about the current conditions. Now, I I drew the comparison to what they were dealing with at the time that these very words were written Because you and I, we can get real good at complaining about the current set of conditions. You might not believe me, but whoever wins the presidency of the United States of America in this next election is not the biggest thing on the planet Earth. It's not the thing we have to be the most worried about. Okay? And I say that as a patriot, as someone that loves this country very much. But that is not the most important thing that's going to happen over the next couple years. Okay? So... Worrying about your current set of conditions is an easy thing that gets in the way from allowing us to put Christ at the top of our mind and to honor him as holy or selfish ambitions, just things that we get wrapped around the axle on that we become obsessed with that we feel like we have to do that we must go and accomplish at all costs or maybe not all but most costs. And that's a very dangerous place for us to find ourselves when we allow these things that are in front of us, the the things that we can get kind of intrigued with or even obsessed with to kind of take over what we think about and what we do or thinking that you're in control that it's actually you that controls what's going to happen in your life and how and when and where things take place that's a lie you're not in control neither am i And so these are the things that if we allow them to, they can begin to creep into our heart, creep into our mind, and they begin to to battle with what we know should be the case, which is Christ is at the top of our mind and that we're honoring him as holy. These are the things that can compromise that if we're not careful. So Peter tells them, in your hearts, honor Christ as holy. Step one. The next one is to always be prepared. Always be prepared. And so it begs the question, when it comes to spiritual matters, because remember Peter's point here, or dare I say the the inspired words given to Peter, are that there's something more at hand. There's more to what you should be living for. And so you need to be prepared. And so the question is, how often are you spending time preparing yourself spiritually? Like truly preparing yourself for the battle you face every day in your own life. How often do you spend time preparing for that? It's an intentional thought that requires preparation. So if your first thought is, you know, I don't actually focus on that. I don't really set aside time to prepare for that. Then that's a great thing for you to take note of and say, I need to change that. 
Because if you're not intentional, if you're not setting aside time for preparation in order to always be prepared, then you're missing the point. It's a heart that is always in the ready position, always being prepared. It reminds me of Ephesians 6, chapter 11, when Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, and the gospel to guide your path. He's talking about being prepared. As a soldier puts on its armor, we are called to do that in our spiritual lives in order to always be ready. Or 2 Timothy 2, or excuse me, 4, 2 through 5, where it says, be ready in season and out of season. You know, they were in season, as I would like to say, because they were literally under fire. Okay, well, you might make an argument that we might be considered out of season in the sense that we don't face imminent death for the fact that we've assembled here tonight to worship God and to lift up Christ as the Almighty. That might be one way to look at it, but it doesn't change the responsibility that we have. Be ready in season and out. Are you prepared? And do you maintain a position of preparedness? Then the next question, obviously, is prepared for what? To make a defense. The word here, defense, brings to mind apologetics, which is the defense of one's faith. To be able to explain. To be able to tell anyone who asks why you believe what you believe. And I think as a Christian, that's the most basic thing that we should be able to do. And you might say, well, why is this such a big requirement? Well, if we're living as those that have been called out, isn't that what it means, church, to be called out? Then people are going to see that and they're going to ask, why? Why does that person live that way? And then that creates the question mark that then prompts them to ask, and we need to be ready to explain why. It's our least or it is the least that we could be expected to do, to just explain the why. I'll share a story with you because it's an unusual way to make this point, but it's powerful nonetheless. Some of you might know that when I was in high school, Coach McKinney, or you know him as Blake McKinney, was one of my coaches. And I didn't know he was a member of the Lord's Church, and he didn't know that I had grown up any particular way. All I knew is he was my coach, and I was a football player on the team. And of course, I was a defensive lineman, and I hated offensive line. He was an offensive line coach, but I had to have an offensive position. And so half of my practice time was listening to him blow a whistle in my ear while I pushed a sled. That was basically what I did with Coach McKinney. But... There came a time after one of our practices one day when one of the football players got very upset and tried to get physical with Coach McKinney. Literally wanted to physically fight him. And I stood right there. I was no more than five feet away from this exchange. And I remember looking at him as a man with his adrenaline on a 20, on a scale of one to 10, and I could see that he was doing everything in his power to restrain his own self as this man was trying to attack him for no reason. Make no mistake about it. He had done nothing wrong. And I remember as a young teenager, 17, 16 years old, thinking, what is different about that man? Why would he not handle that situation in my mind the way it should have been handled? In my mind, he had every right. And so the why was there, but he never had a chance to make the defense directly to me because I never asked the question, but the why was there until many years later as a newlywed in 2003 when I walked through that doorway right there and within five minutes of visiting for the first time saw his face. Mickey Warner, too, by the way. 
which is another comforting face. She also was a teacher of mine, not to date anyone in the room, but... And immediately, it became apparent to me, literally, even though that much time had passed, why that man was able to control himself in the way that he did and handle himself in a way that was so different than what the world showed. And it was because he was a man of Christ. The point here is that there is a time in every Christian's life where you need to be able to give a defense to explain the why you believe what you believe. And some questions that you and I can ask ourselves today is, are you mindful of your own reasoning in Christ? Do you still understand and believe today as much as you did the moment you made the decision why you died to yourself in order to live in Christ? Do you have a firm grasp on that right now? Is your faith built on solid ground or has it been compromised somewhere along the way? Has the seed of doubt entered into your heart? Have you begun to question things and you're not sure why? Because if these things are not in a ready state, if you don't have a strong command over these things, you're not going to be able to do this. And if it's there, acknowledge it and get things right. Because we need to be prepared to make a defense. To who? To anyone who asks you. You see, when we live that type of life that's countercultural, that's different, where people say, well, why do you keep going to church so much? Or why do you not come to this and you say you're going to go to church instead? Or, or why, why don't you want to go out with us and go drinking tonight? We're just going to go have fun. You know, why, why, why? All the why, why don't you live the way we live? There are going to be these questions that come in the life of any Christian if you're truly living by your faith. It's going to cause people to ask. And when it says anyone, it literally means anyone who asks. So it doesn't mean just family and close friends. But when a stranger asks, you don't tell them why. Or it doesn't mean this group of people over here, but not this group over here. It literally means anyone who asks you, which might mean a coworker, Which might mean someone that, you know, you don't know at all. It's a complete stranger. It might be someone that you know will be furious with you when you give them the answer. To anyone who asks you, the reason for the hope. You see, there are people in this life right now that you and I are around on a regular basis that don't have the assurance that you and I have in our heart and our mind that this world is not our home. They don't understand that when they die, there's way more to the story. They do not have the hope that you and I have been blessed to come to the knowledge and understanding of. And we need to be able to share that when people ask. We have to be able to do that. It's the why and the what. It's not too much to ask. And here's what I love about the very end of this verse. Because it starts with the word yet which means your ears should perk up, right? Because we're still receiving the instruction set. Because by this point, it's come from the inside. We're in your hearts. Honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always being prepared. Those are internal things. Now it's to make a defense to anyone who asks you. Now we're outside. Now we're on the outside. We're talking to people. We're giving the defense. It says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You see, sometimes when you think about making a defense, especially in today's climate, well, that means you get to fight. That means you get to just go after somebody. And that is wrong. That is wrong as wrong can be. Gentleness, respect. The New King James says meekness and fear. So you should be wondering here for a second, well, how do fear and respect? You see, when you and I think respect, you mean maybe just being respectful of the person that you're talking to, but that's not what's being said here in this verse. It's saying respect and fear for the outcome in in a situation where we do not honor the truth, where we do not share what needs to be said, where we compromise honoring Christ in your heart as holy, and you do something contrary to that, that is what you should fear, not what that other person may or may not think or may or may not do. 
But when we deliver this to them, that we do it with gentleness, with meekness. That has to be the state of mind that we have when we go to share this, regardless of what they do. That's why I shared the story of Coach McKinney, because that was a very intense situation. And he personified meekness in that moment. Power under control. We have the power of the gospel in our hearts, brothers and sisters. That's strong. But we need to share with people with gentleness. And we need to have love in our hearts as we do it. And we need to do it. The book of Acts, if you read through it, it doesn't take long to see a pattern in how Paul handled this in his own life as he was evangelizing the known world on his missionary journeys. Words that we find are reasoned and persuaded and explained. Does that sound like somebody's going in there and making a bunch of enemies? Sure, some of them didn't like what he had to say, but in terms of how he delivered it, does that sound like someone that was cognizant and aware and very respectful of the person that he was dealing with as he persuaded Is he explained? That's the kind of attitude we need to have. That's the kind of heart that we need to have as we go to share the why and the what we believe when people ask, why are you different? And if you're not different, you need to be worried. Because you can't live a Christian life in this life and not be different. The power is in the truth itself, not you or I. The power is in the Word of God. And we need to understand that. You don't need to be powerful in terms of how you deliver the truth. Let the Word of God do what it's designed to do. And the fear and the respect aspect of this is really to speak to the sanctity of the truth itself. We are not to alter, distort, compromise, adjust, or change this truth. And it should make you worried if you feel compelled to do so. That's what's implied here with this word fear or this word respect. So I leave you with these few things to think about. Where are you? Because... As I mentioned, we've got this congregational effort that we're going to go into beginning next month. And the reason why I wanted to have this lesson with you tonight is because I'd like for you to consider this verse and to consider in your own heart and mind where you are and and maybe use this next 30 days to prepare your heart and mind so that we can come together as a family of Christ and do something special. To reach this community with the gospel. You know, we can't sit back and say the world needs Jesus. But as followers of Christ, not go through an extraordinary effort to do it. Because if it's not you and I that's going to do it, well, then who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? So are you honoring Christ in your own heart? In order to be prepared to share your faith, you might have to start with yourself. You might have to really get some things in order. And don't be afraid of that. I lived through this myself. I had some things out of order. I can't share my faith if I'm all messed up on the inside. It's useless to even try, so start there. Are you honoring Christ in your heart? If you're not, let's get to that point. Let's clean that up. Rekindle that fire that once brought you to this point. And bring it back. Are you prepared to make a defense? Have you walked through in your own heart and mind how you would go about telling someone the why and the what of what you believe? If you haven't, spend some time thinking that through. How would you tell the person next to you if they said, hey, what do you believe? What if they just came and said, what do you believe about spiritual things? What would you say? What would your answer be? If you don't have a good grasp of that in your own heart and mind, start there. Spend time this month thinking about how you'd answer that question. What is the what and what is the why? Go on that journey. Do you live with the hope that you have in Christ every day? Because if you live with the hope that we have in Christ, then all this noise that's going on around us is nothing but noise. And people will notice that. 
people will want to know why you are not as rattled as every other person next to you because of all these things that are just doom and gloom. Go read a history book and know that we are nowhere close to the bottom of what mankind is capable of. Maybe just go back to Genesis chapter 5 as you go into 6. We're nowhere close. Not even in the history of this country are we close to how bad it can be. Be different. And if you're not different, then, then do this. Live by the hope that you have in Christ. Let it reign supreme in your mind. Let it drive your decision making. Let it dictate how you're going to be. And have you learned how to be gentle when talking about spiritual things? And I want you to listen to me when I say this. Have you learned how to be gentle when you talk about spiritual things with other people? We are surrounded by a horrible example of how two people share differing thoughts. Do not believe that lie. Gentleness. And if this is something you struggle with, then spend the next 30 days working through this in your own heart and mind on how to become more gentle. We have Christ as our example, and we represent him whether you like it or not. And so we have to heed, yield to these words to do it with gentleness in our heart. And that's what I'd like to challenge you to do over the next 30 days. July will be here before we know it, if you can believe that. And we have a chance to do something very special. And I want us to rise to the occasion. I really do. The world needs it. Bad. And so maybe spend some time thinking through these things and going through and doing your own inventory in your own heart and being honest with yourself and just finding where you might be vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. Every one of us has something on this list that we can work on. Every last one of us. Be prayerful about this. Spend time reading 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Go through that checklist and truly be honest with yourself. Now tonight, the lesson is yours. But I want you to consider that we still have an opportunity here before we break. And it's one where, as a, as a body of Christians who love each other very much, we have a chance to support each other right here if someone is in need. We can't put on a good face here every day and act like everybody's just doing great because that's not true. And so if you're struggling tonight, you have a chance here to be among people that love you more than you could ever possibly realize. People that are trying to get better at showing it to each other day by day because we're all imperfect, but it doesn't change the fact that we love each other. And if you need help getting your life back on track, you're around the only group of people that are going to really take that to heart and try to support you as you do that. And even, even equally as important if you're here tonight and you haven't done that one thing that I kind of started the lesson off with, which is that you've died to yourself. There's this beautiful moment at the end of every one of our lessons where there's this invitation where someone can do that. Because you see, that's what this whole life is all about. Dying to yourself. Not just the people in this building, but to this whole world. That's what it's all about. Dying to yourself. And there's a way that the scriptures tell us to do that. That's through the waters of baptism. And there's an opportunity right now, if anybody is ready to make that step, it's the most important decision a human being is ever going to make, whether they choose to do it or not. It's still the most important decision. And the opportunity exists to do it right here and right now. If you have any needs, please, you are loved. You are among people that want to support you. Please come forward now as we stand and sing for your encouragement.